Thanks everyone for joining our first Budget Bee Call of 2016. This is Precious Buchu, Outreach and Operations Coordinator at the Washington State Budget and Policy Center. And with me on this call are my colleagues, Misha Wershkel, Executive Director, Andy Nicholas, Senior Fiscal Analyst, and Elena Hernandez, Policy Analyst. Welcome team. For those of you who are not familiar with the Budget and Policy Center, we are a research organization dedicated to advancing the prosperity of all Washingtonians. We host these calls throughout the legislative session to provide relevant information and news from Olympia. A few quick housekeeping notes. There are a number of people on the line, so we have muted all lines to avoid background noise. If you have questions for us... The conference has been muted. ...online and send them to us using the chat function on ReadyTalk. We will respond to as many as we can during the last few minutes of the call. We are recording this discussion and it will be posted to our website soon. For today's call, our team will give highlights on what to expect this legislative session, which begins on Monday. We'll first hear from Misha, who will introduce the political context in Olympia. Then we'll hear from Andy, who will give an overview of the budget from last November's forecast and Governor Inslee's recent budget proposal. After that, Elena will touch on a few bills and initiatives to watch for during session. At the end, we will answer any questions you may have for the team. So now, I'll be handing it over to our new executive director. Misha Wershkel started with us in October, and this is her first Budget Beat call. We're so pleased to have her here at our organization and on this call. Here's Misha to provide the political context in Olympia. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining today's call. As Precious said, I'll just start off by providing a bit of political context. So most people know the session starts next Monday, January 11th, and this year is a, quote, short session, meaning the legislature is convening for 60 days. What that means is that the last day of session um, is scheduled to be March 10th, 2016. The makeup of the legislature this year is largely the same as it was last year. I just want to note a couple of important changes. First, in the November 2015 elections, the Democrats lost one seat in the House. Democrat Carol Gregory from the Federal Way area was ousted from her seat by Terry Hickel, a Republican. So now the Democrats have just a single vote majority in the House and it may be more difficult to move controversial policy through the House. Second, there's just some new faces and some people moving places in the legislature. Two that I wanted to highlight are um, specifically related to the work of the Washington State Budget and Policy Center, are that the House Finance Chair, Reuben Carlisle, was appointed to fill Jeannie Colwell's seat in the Senate, which then allowed Noel Frame to be appointed to fill his House seat and Representative Chris Litton took over as the new chair of the Finance Committee. Also, um, the former chair of the House Appropriations Committee, Representative Ross Hunter, left the legislature in order to become the director of the Department of Early Learning. And longtime Representative Hans Dunshi took over as the chair of the Appropriations Committee. Looking forward to the session starting next week, most political insiders have fairly low expectations about what will be accomplished during the session, and most expect the legislature to end after just 40 days. So we don't anticipate a number of special sessions extending the legislative session as there have been in previous years. A couple of reasons why there are kind of low expectations for what will be done this year are first that you know, we continue to have divided government and a lot of differences of opinion about how to address the big issues facing the legislature. Many would say that the biggest issue facing the legislature is how to address the McCleary ruling and how to address funding for education. There's very little consensus among legislators about how they want to handle this. Some legislators are advocating for property tax reform, Others want to see policy changes related to charter schools before addressing funding issues. Some want to focus on teacher compensation first. Others want to pass a capital gains tax. And there are many, many other ideas about how to address the McCleary ruling. 
A second reason for the low expectations is that 2016 is a major election year. So this year, the governor, half of the Senate, and all of the House members are up for re-election. Also, many legislators are running for other seats, either at the local or federal level. And since legislators cannot fundraise while they're in office, many will be anxious to wrap up the session quickly in order to focus on their campaigns. The third reason I would just note, and Elena will talk about this further, is that some of the major policy issues that were very contentious in 2015 are likely to be tackled through ballot initiatives. So specifically, climate and minimum wage and sick leave, big policy items from the 2015 session look likely to head to the ballot um, in 2016. So all that said, unexpected things could happen, and we're hopeful at the Budget and Policy Center that there will be more action on major priorities. All the bills from the 2015 session are technically still alive and could be um, subject to action by the legislature. And there are new proposals, like the governor's proposal on tax exemptions that Andy will discuss further that may spark um, consensus around bigger issues in the budget. Certainly, there's a good amount of pressure related to addressing McCleary. I know many legislators are feeling that, and we may be able to see a breakthrough of some kind between the House and Senate on this. With that, I'll turn it back over to Precious and be happy to answer questions at the end of the call. Thank you, Misha. Now let's turn to Andy. Andy, can you give listeners context around the state's financial situation and the governor's recent budget proposal? Thanks, Precious. I'd be happy to do just that. So, Prior to crafting his budget proposal, Governor Inslee faced both some positive news that would help him do so and some negative news. On the positive side, since the budget was enacted in June and we had the June economic forecast, uh, there have been higher revenue collections than, than have been expected, giving us about $245 million more in revenue resources than were originally predicted when the budget was passed. That additional revenue is mostly due to higher collections uh, from a hot housing market or real estate excise tax collections. There have also been uh, higher collections of B&O taxes, primarily from service sector businesses. And then finally, auto sales have been higher uh, than expected, uh, giving us greater sales tax revenues, given that there is a small sales tax surcharge on cars. So we have some additional tax resources as a result of higher collections coming into crafting the budget. Um, but despite this good news, there have also been a lot of pressures on the cost side of the budget that have driven up and made the cost of providing consistent existing levels of public services more expensive. Many of you have heard about the wildfire season that we had in 2015, which was unusually bad. That has added almost $180 million in additional uh, cost pressures to compensate for the cost that those incurred and to get us prepared for the 2016 wildfire session, which could also be bad. Medicaid caseload has grown faster than predicted, costing about $180 million. Um, public safety, long-term care, child care, child protective services, all things that have had costs exceed original expectations when the budget was initially passed. And of course, we have court cases that will cost uh, additional too. Uh, there's a psychiatric uh, boarding case, which requires us to reform and put additional resources for mental health funding. And then of course, there is the overarching McCleary ed basic education case, which in many ways overhangs everything that we're talking about, as Misha said. And on top of that, uh, we have Initiative 1366, which was narrowly approved by voters in November, and if that is allowed to go into effect, could cost uh, up to $1.5 billion per year in reduced sales tax revenues if the legislature fails to enact a constitutional amendment uh, to require a two-thirds supermajority vote for any revenue increase. So all of those things put together, the good and the bad news, um, that we did not in fact face a current services budget shortfall. In other words, the governor could have put forward a budget that would have remained in balance, but without taking steps 
to, to generate additional resources and to uh, make additional adjustments, we would have been dangerously close to completely depleting uh, the built-in ending fund balance in the budget, which would have exposed the state uh, to a considerable amount of risk if other unexpected costs or uh, various state emergencies come up. Um, so in light of these, the context around what was happening, the governor then proposed a budget that would generate about $42 million in additional resources by transferring funds from various accounts into the general fund. He proposes to tap the state rainy day fund or budget stabilization account to the tune of about $178 million to pay for the added cost of wildfires. And he also gets another $136 million by not transferring additional revenues into the rainy day fund as a result of the extraordinary revenue growth provision, which would have been triggered this year as a result of uh, high economic growth that we're experiencing right now. And again, that gets him about $136 million. So overall, this generates resources um, that he would have needed to uh, compensate for the increased costs and in just maintaining existing uh, caseloads and other things that um, are required to keep existing levels of services. He would, have, he would be able to pay for the wildfires and help prepare for next year's fire season. And he can make several new investments in this budget in high priority areas like mental health services, child protective services, some environmental uh, investments as well. It's important to note that his budget completely ignores 1366 altogether. Um, and it's understandable why he would want to do this because the hole that that initiative could create would be quite catastrophic. Um, and there is good reason to believe that it will be overturned by the courts. And that's a subject that we will address in a future budget beat call down the line. So stay tuned for that. Um, in addition to the sort of normal baseline budget that adds a few additional investments and maintains existing levels of services, he has a separate proposal um, designed to increase salaries among first-year teachers by about $4,000 per year to an average of around $40,000 per year. Um, and that's a great start on addressing the teacher compensation uh, part of the McCleary requirement, um, but it's certainly only one step of many that we'll have to go because we need to be ensure that we're paying teachers and, and all public sector workers enough so that we can uh, have a, you know, the best uh, uh, providers that we have that we can keep and retain high quality employees and teachers for uh, public services. Um, and to do that, he responsibly proposes to generate more than $100 million per year by closing four wasteful tax breaks. Now, for those of you who have been following this, the tax breaks that he proposes to eliminate have been uh, in con contention before. We've seen a number of these before. They include the sales tax exemption on bottled water, a sales tax exemption claimed by non-residents, mostly Oregonians, Montanans, and Alaskans, a sales tax exemption claimed by oil refineries on fuel they use to power their operations, uh, and the newer one is a real estate exemption, uh, a real estate excise tax exemption that banks and mortgage lenders claim on properties uh, that are sold at foreclosure. So these four tax breaks would provide $100 million per year in additional resources and help fund uh, salary inc increases primarily for first year and early career teachers. So what do we as the Budget and Policy Center think overall of the governor's proposals? Well, we think the new investments are a really good step, um, but much more is needed, especially in light of McCleary. As Misha mentioned, we have a lot more, a much further way to go on meeting that court mandate, and that's going to require uh, bigger investments than we have seen proposed so far. Um, and while we like his actions on revenue, we do think he should be uh, bolder in that regard too. We'd like to see more tax breaks eliminated and for him to continue the fight on passing a capital gains tax in order to generate hundreds of millions of dollars in additional resources for education and other priorities. And finally, his use of the state rainy day fund uh, is debatable. 
Many would argue that um, we should be saving that for when the economy takes a downturn, but it, it is also reasonable to say that you should be using the rainy day fund for state emergencies and the wildfire season certainly um, qualifies as both of those. And just sort of to close things up, it is really important to note that while we have been making a number of additional resources or, or additional investments in basic education and a few other things since the worst part of the recession, that when you look at state spending in context, it remains quite depressed by historical standards. And so what you see in front of you, uh, for those of you that are on screen, you can see state uh, total state government spending as a share of the economy going back to 2003. Um, and you can see that we're still near historical lows, even under the governor's proposal, that um, we have dropped as, a, as our share of our total economy of what we're putting into public services has fallen and remains quite low. Um, so that's a, a good piece of context um, as we discuss the budget for moving forward. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Precious, and I'd be happy to answer additional questions during the Q&A period. Thank you, Andy. Next, we have Elena, who will talk about key things to watch for this session. Great. Um, <coughs> thank you, Precious. So I want to talk about uh, three different policy areas that we're going to be focusing on pretty heavily at the Budget and Policy Center, and then finish up with talking about some of the initiatives that we expect to see on the ballot in 2016. So to start, uh, the Budget and Policy Center works on a wide array of issues that promote a more prosperous state, um, but we understand that we can't achieve that goal until we achieve racial equity and meaningfully tackle institutional racism. So as our friends uh, down at Policy Link out of Oakland, California, so eloquently state, racial equity is a moral imperative, yet it's also a superior growth model. Uh, Policy Link's National Equity Atlas shows that in 2012, the Washington State GDP was about $375 billion. If we were to erase racial disparities in income and employment, our state GDP would have been $406 billion. So that's an increase of about $30 billion, showing that it really is a, a superior growth model in addition to being uh, obviously a moral imperative. So now to really move the needle for communities of color and advance racial equity, we have to do our work differently. And one key element is to understand how our policies and programs either advance racial equity or perpetuate institutional racism. And one way to do that is through racial equity impact statements. And there are several states across the nation, including our neighbors to the south in Oregon, that have instituted racial equity impact statements similar in form to the fiscal notes that we have here in Washington for various forms of legislation. And in Washington State, of course, we have examples through the city of Seattle and King County as potential local models. So last session, we saw uh, from both Senator Hasegawa and Senator Jayapal, uh, they both put forth uh, legislation that would lead the way for our state to do the same through state policy. And this session, we expect to see continued push for Senator Hasegawa's bill, which has a companion in the House sponsored by Representative Sawyer. So Hasegawa's bill sought to bring together community members, uh, people from the Office of Financial Management, OFM, the Caseload Forecast Council, and others to create recommendations for instituting racial equity impact statements for any legislation that increases caseloads in criminal justice, human services, and education. And we at the Budget and Policy Center and our partners recognize the importance of doing racial equity impact statements both at an organizational level and, of course, uh, the imperative importance of doing it at the state level so we can really start to understand um, how we're impacting racial equity and how we can meaningfully tackle institutional racism. So that's definitely a bill that we'll be keeping a close eye on throughout session. And another uh, focus for us will be the TANF, or Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, cash grant restoration. So as many of you probably know, the TANF cash grant's been cut by about 15% um, since 2011, despite increases in need. Uh, last year, we were able to get a 9% cash grant restoration, which was great. But the truth is that the TANF cash grant has been declining for a pretty long time. Uh, according to the Washington State Self-Sufficiency Standard, which is out of the University of Washington, what it takes to cover the cost of basic needs for a family in Washington has increased by 40 or 54% since 2001. And prior to the partial cash, cash grant restoration last year, uh, the TANF cash grant had actually declined by 49%. So at the same time that basic needs are increasing, the TANF cash grant has been declining. And like I said, we were able to get a 9% cash grant restoration, and we're going to continue to push for that remaining 6% during this session. And this is particularly important for family economic security in our state. 
Remember that the vast majority of individuals that are receiving TANF in the state are kids. That's 67,000 kids and 42,000 families. So strengthening the TANF cash grant is essential to make sure that when families fall on hard times in our state, they have the ability to get back on their feet. And then I also want to talk a little bit about uh, equitable implementation of the Early Start Act. Last session, we saw a historic investment in early childhood education with the passage of the Early Start Act. And this year, the work of ensuring that equitable implementation of the act really begins. So this includes one of our legislative priorities, which is eliminating the, the wait list for Working Connections Child Care. Working Connections Child Care is our state's largest child care subsidy program, um, ensuring that families with low incomes have access to quality child care. The program serves about 47,000 kids each month and families that make less than 200% of the federal poverty line or about $48,000 a year for a family of four can qualify. And as many of you know, especially if you have kids, uh, child care has become one of the biggest components of the family budget, second only to housing. And this is particularly true for families of color whom, for whom child care represents upwards of 25% of their monthly expenses. So ensuring that parents struggling to make ends meet have access to quality childcare and early learning opportunities for their kids improves outcomes for the entire family. Kids that gain access to quality, kids gain access to quality early learning opportunities and parents can go to work knowing that their kids um, are being cared for and they can focus on, on getting ahead. So in terms of policy areas, those are going to be some of our primary focuses. And as Misha mentioned earlier, uh, there are several key policies that we've worked on over the past year that are going to be moving towards an initiative strategy rather than a legislative strategy. And two key areas that we expect to see on the very packed 2016 ballot um, result around minimum wage and paid sick leave as well as the carbon emissions reduction um, plan. So in terms of minimum wage and paid sick leave, we do expect to see an initiative on the ballot in 2016. There'll be more information about what's covered in that initiative um, in the coming weeks. Probably keep, out, keep a lookout for that next week. And in January is a big deadline for, for submitting initiatives for the 2016 ballot, so we expect to have more clarity around uh, the Carbon Emissions Reduction Initiative through the Alliance for Jobs and Clean Energy uh, very soon as well. So with that, I'll pass it back to Precious. Thank you, Elena. We'd now like to take questions from our listeners. We have just a few minutes, so we'll just go over a few of the questions that we have. Uh, the first question is, uh, Initiative 732 first goes to the legislature. Can they simply ignore it? So because it is an initiative to the legislature, they can ignore it, which would mean it would go to the ballot as is. Um, they can also pass it as is, or they can compete, like send a competing measure to the ballot, um, in which case there would be two, uh, two policies relating to carbon emissions on the ballot. Thanks, Elena. Uh, we have another question here. How do we keep the momentum going around important policies during this short session and the election year? Misha? Great, so I can tackle that. So um, I would say two things. First, you know, I started off the call by saying there are low expectations about what can be done this legislative session. And I would say, you know, the first thing is that we shouldn't accept those low expectations as, you know, um, a fact. And that there really are major policy challenges facing the state, major needs around investments in education, um, to reform our tax system, to address poverty and that we um, you know, should be pushing legislators to take bolder action um, and not accept these low expectations as you know, that's the way it has to be. The second thing is that you know, I would encourage um, all, everyone to be in touch with legislators um, throughout the session about policy and budget priorities that are important to you. You know, there are um, groups working on a number of the different policy and budget items that Elena and Andy mentioned, as well as uh, many, many other policies. And um, I would encourage you to get connected with those groups. For example, Children's Alliance is working on some of the anti-poverty policies um, and the implementation of the early um, learning bill from last year. Um, get involved with those organizations through their lobby days um, and also just be in touch with your legislators directly through the ledge.law.gov website. 
Thanks, Misha. And we just have time for one more question. And the question is, does Inslee's budget account for the $100,000 a day fine imposed for McCleary? Uh, Andy, could you take that question? Sure. Just a little bit of background on that. Some of you may remember that earlier, or in 2015, during the summer, the court uh, issued fines against the legislature for not uh, putting forward a plan to completely fund basic education within the time frame that they've laid, laid out. And the fine was uh, equivalent to around $100,000 a day. And then the question is, is, well, so how does this affect the budget? What the governor has done is uh, set aside funding, and I believe in the Education Legacy Trust account, uh, to pay for those or to put those towards education, the fine amounts. Um, but not indefinitely. Uh, it, it will expire early on in the legislative session or it won't be enough. And I think the, the intent there is to put some pressure on the legislature to address uh, that issue during session in a more formal way. Um, so the answer is sort of partially. Okay. Thanks, Andy. We actually need to sign off now. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and many thanks to Misha Werschkel, Andy Nicholas, and Elena Hernandez for participating in this call. And stay tuned to our website, budgetandpolicy.org, for details of the next Budget B call and a recording of this call. After you sign off, a survey will pop up on your screen, and we'd appreciate if you'd give feedback. Thanks again for participating, everyone, and have a great weekend.